Hi everyone. I mentioned I'm actually uh, this is a little early, but I'm I need to be doing some technical tests. So I really apologize for uh, the uh, confusion for the next few minutes. But uh, yeah, technical blah 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 stuff about uh, YouTube changing how all their servers work and everything. So I need to make sure. Oh crap. Yeah. So there's step one. Is I actually need to do two steps. Oh, it says I'm starting. Am I going? I don't see anything yet. But that's the right thing. And it says I'm going. Oh, maybe it knows it's not time yet. And I'm previewing. That could be that would be actually kind of cool if that were the case. Um okay. So that much is good. Now what if I go to my old <clears throat> uh link if i go to my old link um i would love it oh my gosh look at that i'm live wow okay so that works what if i put in mastery muse score here that would be kind of cool um nope why not Oh, C. Gosh darn it. Okay, that one is live too. All right, so I'm going to paste this link. Um, oh, and it said, oh, it's 1030 and uh, here I am. Okay. <clears throat> so I think that I don't know what I'm doing still <laughs> is, is the, uh, the bottom line here, but um, I think this is going to be good. So I'm, mm, yeah, I think, let me see if y'all see me. You're probably getting a nice view of the back of my computer right now. Oh, 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 what happened? What happened? Stop. No. Dang it. Here I am. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I realize that. I'm, uh, um, I'm working on two computers at once while I work out, while I work out these technical things here. So I actually, um, what I might do is I might stop and start again. Now I'm not, I'm not going to risk screwing things up worse. Um, so I'm going to go with it the way I have it and, um, and I will learn more <laughs> as I go along. So, um, yeah, for people who don't know, YouTube has like a m variety of different ways of managing this, uh, live streaming business. And, um, uh, you probably want to see something more interesting than that. Okay. Um, they have a number of ways of managing this and they have made the way I used to be using obsolete. And so I'm trying to migrate over to one of these new ones they introduced over the last couple months, um, and um, I still don't totally understand how it works. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, this is Mark Sabatella. I'm the director of the Mastering Muse Score School. And this is my regular series of uh, live chats about usually some aspect of making Muse Score, m making music with Muse Score. And most of the time, the focus is on Muse Score itself. Um, but this time, I'm actually going to be talking less about. Muse score. I'm going to use Muse score in the example, but I want to talk more about the process of learning music, and in particular of learning music theory and doing ear training, which are they go hand in hand, and I think everyone recognizes at some level that they go hand in hand, but um, they're often taught separately. Like the school where I teach, I teach, uh, a, well, I've, I've taught a music theory class there, and then there's a separate class called oral skills that people take. Or right now I'm teaching a class called foundations of music, which is like a pre-music theory. It's, it's learning the real basics, just major and minor scales and uh, triads, um, not so much what you do with that. Um, so this uh, uh, 
that course also has a companion course called basic musicianship which is the aural component and so it's kind of separated out even though we all recognize that they should be connected and so the other thing that y'all probably many of you who are watching this might be aware uh, I have done a lot of work uh, with blind students well with a couple of blind students in particular but worked with fairly extensively <clears throat> and done a lot of work on MuseScore making it accessible to blind musicians and in my discussions like there's the you know uh, mailing lists and forums and Facebook groups and so forth talking where uh, blind musicians are talking um, the, the idea has come up that there really isn't a lot of great uh, music theory uh, training available if you're blind because a lot of the textbooks and so forth aren't available in Braille and even if they are that's still just something written you don't really get to hear things so I went to a lot of work to make my uh, my basic music theory course accessible to blind musicians through uh, by using MuseScore in it but it's still it's very technically focused and you spend a lot of time you know working at the keyboard to manage all the stuff and the idea came up that really you should be able to learn music theory purely by ear just by listening and then I realized that um, you know I've been listening to audiobooks the last I don't know like the last two years I've maybe discovered audiobooks um, I mean I've always known they've existed but I've been listening to them and recently like the last few months no the last year or so podcasts and there's an awful lot of information that you can take in um, purely orally and what I'm looking to do is to figure out how to do that right I mean you guys it's really wonderful having all of you that are here watching right now I see there's 14 people watching right now well that I mean it says that right there but I'm guessing some of you turn it on and then are do doing the dishes or doing whatever else doing some chores doing some homework doing whatever listening in the background and you're really taking in more of the uh, what I'm saying than what you're seeing on screen now some of you uh, I'm sure are sitting there watching and that's great um, but I, I know that I do that with videos right I'll, I'll put them on and then I'll close that uh, I'll like minimize that window while I do something else so the idea that it should be possible to present information in purely uh, an oral way um, has really been you know spinning around in the back of my head for the last year or so and I'm kind of thinking it's basically uh, um, basically time okay I've got your undivided attention thank you um, so um, and and I have been listening to podcasts like watering the garden I'll go out in the wa I'll go out in the garden and water and and man it would be really nice to go to listen to something and learn something about music I have tried a couple of the uh, music uh, podcasts that are there to see what's there to see you know does do, does the world need me to do this and well the world doesn't need anything except you know whatever um, but uh, yeah I think I think I have something to offer in here and so what I want to do here is I'm gonna show you a couple of things that I am thinking about I'm gonna ask you guys a questions and I would love it if those of you who are able to you know sitting there at computers or whatever and able to participate in the chat can uh, give me comments and so what I'm gonna do is I got to bring up uh, give me a second here. The document where I started uh, taking notes. Um, so I have some ideas of things that I want to do and some ideas of the concepts that I think I can convey through a podcast. Um, now, whether it literally turns into a podcast or whether it's something else, I still can't say. But let, let's go on the assumption it's a podcast. One of the things about a podcast is it's not necessarily organized. It's just like a weekly thing. You tune in like these cafes are, right? It's not like a, a graduated course where you start here, you progress through, and end here. I'm not saying that doesn't have value also. But I'm already doing courses, right? <clears throat> and I would love to do an ear training course. But, um... Uh, and I might but this is something different um, so because if you're gonna be a, doing a purely audio thing you might as well <clears throat> be able to do it in the, the means that people consume this which tends to be uh, well podcasts are a big one these days so um, I want to talk about first the purpose for learning theory why it is that we learn theory so I'm gonna be um, uh, bouncing back and forth um, 
between talking about theory and talking about ear training as if they are different things, which they are not, right? And so really I want to be tying these things together the best way that I can. But um, I want to talk, okay, so I want, I want to talk about theory a little bit separately from the ear training first and then talk about the ear training. So as far as the singing goes, um, um, anyone who has heard me sing on any of these things knows that I am not really a singer, right? I, uh, I sing just well enough to make whatever point I want to make. And to me, developing that skill is useful for a number of reasons that I will talk about. But the nice thing about what I'm talking about here is you do it in the privacy of your own home or whatever. And um, whatever, whatever there is to learn from doing it, you don't have to bother anyone else with it. And so that's one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to get out of this. All right. So when I talk about the purposes of learning theory or of learning ear training, um, <clears throat> in fact, OK, forget that. Forget that there's a distinction. There is no there is no meaningful distinction today. Um, why? Why do we care? So I, I'm a it's a rhetorical question. I've got some great answers. I'm going to tell you some of my answers, but I would love in the chat if you can tell me some of your answers, why any of this matters. So <clears throat> if you are a singer and you are singing in a choir, sight singing obviously is a useful skill, right? You get some new sheet music and you want to sing it in that choir setting and you need to be able to sing it by looking at the music. Maybe you haven't had time to go home and plunk it out on the piano, which might be the other way of learning it, or learn it by, you know, having the, the choir director or someone else make you a recording of just your part, right? There's all these ways you can learn your part. But learning it just by being able to read the sheet music is a really, really useful skill. So that's one thing about ear training, if you're a singer. Now, if you're an instrumentalist, you'd say, well, I don't need that, right? I don't necessarily need to be able to do that. Okay, but there's a lot of other things, like for brass players, being able to sort of visualize or auralize, that's barely even a word, um, the sound you're about to make is an important step in setting up your embouchure correctly. Um, so uh, most choir member, most of the choir members in Marcus's choir uh, sing by ear. Um, so singing by ear, but what does that really mean? How did you learn the music? Did they learn it by reading it? Or more likely, they learned it <clears throat> by listening to the person next to them or having a recording. Okay, so now if you're going to create music. So I was just talking about someone performing in an ensemble. And so if you're a singer or maybe a brass player, being able to know what you're about to play before you play it is useful. Now, also just thinking about instrumentalists in an ensemble as a clarinet player, which I was um, sitting in, a, say, a concert band. And I've got these, you know, 43 measures of rest. And then I have these cue notes that tell me, oh, here's what you need to be listening for. Um, before you come in, you're going to come in on this note here, D. Yes, you could just literally count your 43 measures rest and ignore the cue notes. But realistically, you, you get lost in the count or you just want to tune out and you're, you know, whatever. The cue notes are really useful. And so it's great if you can look at those cue notes and sort of imagine what they are going to sound like so that when the flutes actually play that line, you're like, oh, here we are. And now I know when to come in. So there is another use of being able to kind of know what something is going to sound like just by looking at it. Now, if you are a creative musician, and again, here's a distinction I don't really need to make, but I'm going to make it by saying that if you're primarily reading existing music, there's not that there's nothing creative about that, but there's a separate side of the coin if you are either composing or improvising, or even if you don't really think of what you're doing as improvising, but maybe you're a guitar player or a pianist providing accompaniment in an ensemble where you're just working from chord symbols. Um, these are all creative endeavors in which you are figuring out something a little beyond just playing the notes that are there. Now, if you're a guitar player working from the chord symbols and it's got fret diagrams there and you literally are just putting your fingers where it says or working off tablature, okay, then that's that you don't need to know what it's going to sound like first. But if you're, if you're doing anything else um, where you're creating your own accompaniment in any other way, then suddenly knowing before you play something, what, what is this going to sound like is 
is actually a good thing. And knowing what it's going to sound like is a is part it really ties together theory like i know what a c7 chord is and i know if i spread the notes out this way it's probably going to sound a particular way and so you need to know the theory that tells you what notes are in c7 and some good formulas for how to spread the notes out between your hands or what what kinds of shapes are likely to work on the guitar so um anyhow there's knowing that at a theoretical level this could possibly work is one thing and that's a great thing and that's a totally a reason to learn theory and then the reason the ear is involved in there is to realize oh you know what this is going to be a little too low for that particular shape i'd better i'd be better off moving that uh, moving to a different shape because it won't be as low so there's another thing all right um now as a musician working in the jazz or pop or rock folk world anything other than classical we do a lot of playing by ear also um where we uh you hear a song on a recording you're like i want to record i want to play that song and you 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 can't go to the store and buy sheet music for it or even if you could that sheet music may or may not relate to how you want to play it you really want to learn that from maybe a lead sheet where you just have the melody and the chord symbols but maybe you don't have that either we learn music by ear a lot in that world um so the idea that you would just hear some music and then say, I want to be able to figure out what that melody is or what those chords are or what those voicings are that are happening there. Be able to do that all by ear. <clears throat> powerful, powerful thing. And again, it's possible to do things like that purely by ear, like with no knowledge of anything. Like I don't even know what a chord is, but I can tell what all those notes are. That, it's one of the few things that I believe is probably a born with ability I, I don't even know if that's literally true but there's a whole lot about music that i believe anyone can learn and that innate talent is overrated uh, i uh, most musicians who i think who reach a certain level believe that because we would like to believe that we worked to get where we are um, and that it wasn't just something we were born with not that there's nothing uh, that you can be born with and i think some aspects of the ear like perfect pitch especially are definitely things that have a genetic component uh as far as anyone knows um but uh in any case there's certain aspects of being able to like play by ear without knowing theory that some people have managed to do but how did they learn to do that well they probably wouldn't be able to put that into words the way i can tell you to put it into words is going to involve theory right so we're going to learn um uh we're gonna have to learn some theory in order to play by ear is the way that goes and yeah i think we've we've worked to get where we are um i mean i i know that there's some things that have come easily to me and uh i i, I will you know uh thank my parents for their genes as far as that goes but i also know how much work that i put in to uh turn that into something practical okay so um what i have oh and then there's the idea of composing music now when you're composing music or improvising music for that matter you're hearing something in your head and you hear this idea oh it would be really great if if i could take this this melody i'm hearing in my head and either play it or write it out again this is where some amount of this ability to play by ear it's not we're not talking about playing by ear something you've already heard we're talking about playing by ear something you've never heard before you just made it up and now you want to play it by ear or write it out well if you're improvising you don't get multiple chances at it you just got to make your best guess and that's it so it really requires honing or hone is that h silent in that i don't even know honing i'm gonna say um, um your skills um on being able to play by ear something you've never heard before and realistically it's possible to do that with no knowledge of theory also and any number of people do that but the reality is no one knows if what you're playing is really what you heard or not so you could easily be playing something different than what you heard and but as long as it sounds good people are going to go yeah yeah that, that that's fine so um the same is uh true when well what how do i want to say this we we don't know if you're if you're playing exactly what you heard in your head we just know if it sounds good and so 
what theory can do there is help you take this idea that you've heard and then as you're translating it into something you play if your ear wasn't sure gee was that a b or was it a b flat um because you you know if you were just thinking about the melody theory is what's going to allow you to jump in there and say well wait a minute the chord right now is g minor probably it's the b flat not the b natural because the the b natural is going to be wrong over a g minor chord so it's that sort of thing that's going to help you uh sort out what you're hearing now if you're a composer you can play trial and error a lot right like if i'm on a, and so i'm going to make some music here i'm going to sing a little phrase um, okay, give me a, I, I need a, a frame of reference. C, C, okay. Um, there you go, I'm not a singer. Um, so if I hear melody, bum, ba, do, da, do, da, dum. Okay. Boo, da, dum, ba, do, da, dum. I could start trying to plunk that. I already know what the notes are. I'm going to tell you that much right now. You guys can be thinking about that right now also. Don't, don't write in your answers yet. You've heard me sing it. Think about it. Ba, ba, dum, ba, do, da, dum. Um, I would like to think that I've sung that the same way every time, just maybe getting a little um, firmer about it in my voice. Um, so uh, if I start guessing at the notes and start entering them into Muse score, as soon as I enter a wrong note, like, okay, I'm going to tell you right now, bum, Ba -dum. those first three notes let's think about that really hard um but again don't write them in yet i'm going to put down a note and it's the wrong note okay you ready uh so now if i play this did i get it no i didn't now the question is can you even remember the original melody? Well, hopefully so, because hopefully the fact that I sang it several times and told you, think about this, don't lose it, because I'm about to mess you up, that helps. The reality is, though, every time you guess <clears throat> wrong about this idea that you had in your head, every time you guess wrong, you are blurring part of your original idea. And it makes it that much harder to get the original idea. Now, if it's a purely melodic idea like this, bum, ba, dum, ba, do, da, dum, if it's a purely melodic idea, I can sing that idea. And that helps kind of cement it in my head. And I can survive some wrong notes. I could go over to uh, my O Susanna arrangement over here. And come back to where I was, and now I've lost my key reference, but I think I still remember my melody. Bum. Okay. Bum, ba, dum, ba, do, da, dum. Okay, I do still remember it. So that's all great if it's a melody, because I was able to sing it first. But what if my idea was a harmonic idea? It had to do with the chord progression. Well, I can't sing a chord progression. I could maybe sing the roots. I could recite the Roman numerals for it, or the names of the chords that I think are involved, but at some level, it's not. It's not. It's not the same as like what I just did with that melody. Um, so uh, it's easier to lose sight of a harmonic idea. So if you're composing and you start kind of guessing what these notes are, chances are, your guess. Any time you make a wrong guess, you might recognize that's not right. But then it's going to make it harder to get the right answer after that. Furthermore, at least some of the time, you are likely to get guess wrong, come close enough to say, well, I don't know, like maybe you took three tries to get there and the third try was close enough and you're like, well, I don't know if I, I maybe, maybe that's it. I'm just going to go with it. And then you, you really miss something because maybe you heard something that was better and you're settling for something that's not really what you heard. So this guesswork aspect, using notation software or using the piano, there's a reason why many composers, many co composition teachers will tell you don't compose at the piano and they will tell you don't compose 
into your notation software. There's many reasons for it, actually. Uh, some of them are valid, some of them not. There's, there's totally valid reasons to compose at the piano, compose into your notation software. I do it all the time. But I don't want to rely on it. I want to be able to use my ear and my knowledge of theory a little better so that I avoid the pitfalls that come from composing either at the piano or into my notation software. Um, so that I can use those tools for what they're good for, but not let them do things like cause me to settle for something that's not what my real idea was, or cause me to lose my original idea. Now sometimes I, I'll hit on something that is better than my original idea, and I'll, I'll, I'll want to acknowledge that. But as a composer, I want my original idea too. So I will want to write them both down. If I'm composing, I'll write down my, my original idea. And then if I come up with an idea that I think is better, what does better mean? So here's the deal. Uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is, what, uh, 45 minutes? I, I forget the length. Uh, you know, the, it, it was designed, to, some recording of it wanted to be long enough to fit on a CD. So it's nine, 70 minutes? No, it's not just the ninth. It's whatever it is. Um, uh, it's a, It's... It's a lot of music in there. And there's certain themes that come back over and over again. Are they identical every time? No. Well, then why didn't Beethoven just write it, pick the best one and use it every time? Well, because we don't want that much repetition. We want variety. Even if you have one basic theme that you're going to use in multiple places, we don't want only one expression of that theme. Um, we want uh, okay, here's one version of that theme, but here's another version of it that maybe has uh, its own reason to be there. And it's the right version for that place in the composition. One version of it is the right version for this place. Another version is the right version for another place. So that we're using different versions of our theme depending on which... Um, you know, which part of the song we're in, whether we're about to modulate, whether we're coming back after film development, or whether this is the initial expression of the theme. There's all sorts of different reasons why we want different versions of things. So I want to collect all those ideas. Most of my longer compositions start off as you know, scribbles all over a bunch of scraps of paper that include multiple variations of the same idea that later on I sort together. Okay, so I said I was going to ask you guys questions, and I've been just talking a lot. So I, be, I want you now to be thinking about everything I just said, about all these reasons why we care about theory, why we care about ear training. And um, I want you to start getting ready to uh, write them in. But now I want to come back to my melody. And my first step is, bum, okay, so do we even remember C? If you've got perfect pitch, you have no trouble remem remembering C. My, I don't have perfect pitch, but I have pretty good pitch memory. If I heard a C recently, I could still sing a C again. But I might lose that if I hear some song in another key. It might take me a little minute to get back to where a C was. Okay, but C. So now the question is, those of you who are uh, hearing this and able to, uh, to sing and want to sing, I want everyone who feels like it to sing that melody the best you can remember. I deliberately talk for a while to cause people to forget it. Bum, remember the melody? Sing. All right. I'm going to sing it now. Bum, ba, dum, ba, do, da, dum. Now, rhythmically, I probably sang it a little bit differently every time. The only thing I can tell you is that ba, do, dum was three kind of faster notes, like those were eighth notes. Everything else was like quarter notes and half notes, but I, I probably didn't sing it too consistently. So this time, yeah, those are indeed the first three notes. Um, so now that's what I want. Is I want everyone to put in what you what those notes are. And let, it's the key of C. So let's just name the notes. We could also talk about numbers, and we'll talk about solfege, and I'm going to ask about that in a minute. But bum, bottom. So that's, we'll say three quarter notes. C, then, and then, right? And then the next notes, ba -do -da -dum. I can tell you of those four notes, Bam, da, um, it ended on the same note it started with. So the second half of that phrase was four notes, but the last note was the same as the first note. That's one of the things that's really important in in how ear training, how we how you learn to 
play by ear or to recognize melodies, to do melodic dictation, is to recognize when you've hit the same note that you just hit. And um, also things like, were any of those notes not in the key of C? I'll tell you right now, one of those notes was not in the key of C. So um, I have a, a few guesses as to those first notes. I'll uh, give people a moment more. So the first line was bum. Ah, see, I, did I lose my C? No, I'm good. C bottom. And the question is, did I go up? Did I go down? Bum, bottom. Just being able to tell up from down is good. So I see, um, I see one guess of C E C. Well, bum, bottom. Can you sing the first note again? Bum. Did I end on the same note that I started on? Bum, bottom, bum. I want to say no. Right? There's my first note. Bottom. There's my last note. First note. Ba. Last note. First note. Last note. So I didn't end the same place I started. So I would want to maybe sort that out. Well, where did I end? Bum, ba, dum. There's my last note. First note. Last note. If I don't know how big a leap is, that's fine. I can step until I get there and then figure out how many steps did it take. So First note, uh, last note, here's my first note, step, is that it? No, I took one step, that's not it. There's a second step, now I'm there, so I went C, D, E, so now I know the third note is E. I figured out where the last note of that phrase was, whether it was higher or lower than my starting note. If I can just tell it's an E, tell it's a third up, great, when in doubt, I start walking in steps in my voice. This is why I like to be able to sing, because <laughs> um, I want to be able to sing that through. Bum, da, dum, okay, yeah, that's the right note. Um, and then I can say, bum, ba, dum, or what was that note before this? Ba, dum, it's above it, and then it came down. Was it a big leap up, or was it just a step? It was just a step. The next question in my head was, well, was it a whole step or a half step? I'm not good at that. I don't actually, I'm not great at telling the difference between whole steps and half steps. I am great, I don't think so. Ba, da, dum, there's my three. One, two, three, one, four, three, is what that is. It really is one, four, three. Um, now my voice uh, can be off by a quarter step, but I'm gonna go C and then F, E, and take this all down an octave. I'm actually singing it an octave lower still, but whatever. Uh, that's the melody. One, four, three. So um, that is what I did. I, I sorted it out by realizing did I end on the same pitch I started or not, and then if, if not, then well, did I end higher or lower? How much higher or lower? If I can't tell right away, walk until I get there. Walk with my voice, meaning take steps. C, D, E, there it is. And then from E, the next note before that was an F, and then it came down. And if I didn't know again if it's an F or an F sharp, like I was starting to say, I don't hear, um, uh, yeah, so C, F, E. Um, I don't hear half steps and whole steps necessarily. I'm not saying I can't, but that's not the first thing that comes to me. The first thing that comes to me was, was this in the key of C or not? Did it feel like ba da 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 C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. Did it sound like it was only those notes, or did it go outside it? My ear told me ba da da was all in the key. So my first guest was C, F, E. And then the next little line, and so that's correct. My next line, boo, da, dum, then I had ba, do, da, dum. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be completely honest with you. The Yeah, and transcribing a solo. Tra so I talked about learning a song by ear, but as jazz musicians, we do a lot of transcribing, like improvised solos, or some of us do anyhow. Um, learning someone else's improvised solo from a recording so that we can sort of get inside their brain and try to reproduce aspects of it. So um, that, uh, yeah, so this I transcribe away from an instrument and I'm pretty good at it. I mean, I transcribe at an instrument too, but I'm pretty good at working these things out without an instrument just by doing the kind of stuff I'm doing. So when I first sang, boo da dum ba do da dum when I first saying that line, I actually thought the next note, that 
was a different note than it actually was. It wasn't till I think the second time I sang it or the first time I told you that mm, I knew what the notes were <laughs> that I actually realized what the notes were. So I'm not going to answer about whether this was right or not, but I see that we have a, a guess about what those are. Um, okay, and I see two people have the same thing. Um, I'd like to know if anyone has anything different from that. Okay, I'm going to tell you that that G, that's a boo da dum ba do da dum when I first sang it, I thought it was going to be an A. Now, is this because I heard an A in my head and I missed it with my voice? That could be because I'm not a good singer, but I'm not that bad of a singer. So I think I heard it and sang it right, and my first instinct to call it an A was just wrong. But it did not take me long at all to sort out, oh, that really wasn't an A. It was a G. It is a G. Um, so, boo, da, dum, bum. So how do I know that that is a G? Well, I have a good pitch reference of where one is. One, I can always come back to one. I also have a pretty good reference of where five is. One, five, one, one, five, one. I also can sing the tonic triad. One, three, five. So if I go bum, ba, dum, one, three, bum, one, three, bum, well, that is five. If it had been six, one, three, um, I would say, oh, that wasn't five. Well, wait a minute, what is it? One, three, five, bottom. And I'm using my hand. I'm not doing official solfez things. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But ba, bum, bum. There's my five. Mm, there's some other note. Mm, and I would have had to figure out, oh, it's a step above front. But anyhow, bum, ba, dum. And there was that note, bum. So now I know it's a G. And then I'm going down a step. And then I'm going to sum up. Bottom is some little leap up. How far up? I don't know. I don't care. I can look at that last note, bottom, and see it came back to the G, right? Because I already told you ends on the same note that it started on. Bum, boo, da, dum. And then those last two notes, bottom, I'm hearing, oh, that was a step down. Now my ear just needs to know uh, are those notes in the key or not? Bottom, my ear tells me, no, it's not in the key. If I was in doubt, bum, so I went G, one, one, I've drifted a little bit, one, one, I can tell my voice drifted a little bit, one, bottom, bum, bum, so G down, my ear knows that this is not in the key, but if it doubted, I would say, well, let me compare it to what is in the key, one, three, five, four, three, four, five, Five, four, versus five, sharp four is what that is, and then bottom. And then again, I'll ask my ear, was that bottom, was that higher note in the key or not? And my ear says, yes, it is. And if in doubt, again, bum, 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 I can maybe walk my way up to the C, bottom. Oh yeah, that felt like the top of a scale. So if I really know a C major scale and I can sing one, three, five, I can pretty much figure out a whole lot of melodies based on that. So as a technique goes, this is something I use a lot. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, is there a point? Yeah, the, the point is to show one way of doing things. Is it the only way? No, of course it's not the only way. But these, I like to talk through my processes so that if if someone else has a process that works for them, great, you keep using that. If you're struggling to figure out what that first melody was, I like to walk through what my process is. So boo da dum C F E and then G F sharp A G. So those of you who posted the um the uh line uh oh that's another one so okay so using and then using songs as ways of identifying particular intervals so i i'm gonna i i want to come back to that in a second um be, i i don't want to not like lose track of where i was going um i just want to talk through this process of working out a melody by sort of singing it and figuring out where these things are in your voice this to me is the value of singing not to be a great singer i mean if if, if you want to great 
Or if you want to sing in a choir and build a site, sing, great. But for me, it's being able to use my voice to help me work these things out. Um, because I know I'm going to keep singing it the same way before I can figure out the notes to enter into the software before to play on the piano. Um, so intervals are sort of an interesting thing. Um, all the songs that we ever learn for learning what different intervals sound like, almost all of the songs we've ever learned for it are all about intervals between b the notes of the tonic triad. In other words, one, three, and five. Now, not steps, of course, but um, so in other words, like major, a perfect fifth. We always learn um, one to five, a twinkle, twinkle, usually when it's time to learn that. Um, so Flintstones is five, one. I think um, pretty much all the songs that people normally learn. Uh, Star Wars, uh, I see. Bum, ba, da, um, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing up all the John Williams fanfares in my head because now I've got Superman. Bum, ba, da, ba, da. Um, so uh, I can't uh, remember how the Star Wars theme goes. Isn't that so funny? Um, and there's the other thing. Um, someone, someone write in the first three notes. Yeah, so that's the thing, Superman. And that's what's coming to my mind instead of Star Wars. Um, dum, bum, 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 bum. There it is. Thank you. I got it. Um, um, just knowing it was one to five up. Bum, bum. So we learn all these songs, and all the perfect fifths are one to five. Now, one to four. We all learn, here comes the bride. That's usually the first thing you do. Um, bum, bum, ba -dum. Well, if I do that, bum, ba -dum, that's not one, four, four, four. That's in, that is in the key of F. I just sang five, one, one, one. That's what I just sang. I sang again, even though it's a perfect fourth. It was scale degrees one and five. And if you think about the songs we learn to learn what sixths are, my body lies, that's a major six, and it's from scale degree five to scale degree three. Oh, I'm in the wrong key. I'm back to F. Um, C, um, my body lies, that's five to three. Right? So we have um, uh, my body and then N, and B, C, and all the other perfect major sixth songs pretty much are leaps from five to three. Now, someone somewhere has learned one that's not, and that's great. But the point is, we're really only learning a subset of the intervals we need to learn. And then when that same interval comes up in another context, like you have a perfect fifth leap that actually is going from scale degree three to scale degree seven, or scale degree flat two to scale degree flat six yeah, knowing what star wars sounds like doesn't help you hear that interval as well um i guess so i'm not going to remember the back to the future theme uh, that one i don't remember um but uh that's good to know well my melody right here ba -da -da, is uh that's my song now for remembering a perfect fourth from one to four um but, okay, that's good to know that there's at least some songs that people have learned for this. So some people have actually made a study out of saying, well, let's learn all, not just the perfect fifth between one and five, but let's learn all the perfect fifths and find songs for those. So the problem with this is most songs start with the tonic triad. And so we always use little memorable lines at the beginning of a song. So, of course, they're going to be outlining tonic triads because most songs start out outlining the tonic triad. Um it's not exclusively. You'll find other intervals too, other chords at the beginning of a song. But it, it, it's, you're going to be heavily, heavily, heavily biased towards those, and you have to work harder to find other um, examples. So I mentioned the fact that I've I've mostly used letter names because I know what key I'm in, and I use numbers. I use numbers a lot. Solfege is a thing, though, right? Um, do re mi fa sol la ti do, or if you're in a, a uh, certain certain uh, countries C instead of T. In English-speaking countries, we usually use T, and the idea was so we don't have that vowel S get repeated, sol and C. Um, so we use T instead. Um, uh, and that way, I mean the consonants, that, that way you have a different consonant sound for every syllable. I know solfege, but I don't naturally go there. My brain naturally goes to numbers. So I typically 
do that. Or it goes to letter names. I know what key I'm in. Because frankly, when music starts getting sufficiently complex with chromaticism, it's um, that much harder to relate what I'm hearing. So you're welcome. I see a, a nice comment about um, uh, uh, Muse score, and yeah, we, we are working to make it uh, just better and better. So um, the uh, solfege syllables don't come as naturally to me as thinking about numbers, but even numbers don't always come that naturally to me, as I said, dealing with a, a really complex chromatic thing, because a lot of the music that I deal with just doesn't stay in one key very long. It wanders from key to key enough, or is just frankly atonal for sections of it, where there's not even any sense of key, or maybe non-tonal is a better word. Sometimes when people use atonal, they specifically mean there's nothing that even sounds like a chord. Well, I might mean there's things that sound like chords, but they don't add up to a key center. Um, and you're probably wondering what I mean by that. Um, and so let me, uh, let me just load up um, a song of mine that I know I will be able to find that um, is an example of what I mean. Um, so what is shades? So if I load this song here, and I'm going to let MuseScore play the chord symbols for me. Oh, uh, by default it's going to play them because this is still 3-5. Um, in 3-5-1 we're going to make older scores not play by, by the default because it was confusing people. But anyhow, here's some chords. That's way too fast, and you know this is computer playing uh, voicings. But um, in any case, these chords mean nothing in any key. There is no key that makes these make sense. For, for, furthermore, I forgot about this aspect. This melody here, um, is the same melody we have here. Um, it's the same exact melody twice, but he, but totally different harmonizations. This harmonization is got it involves flat key um, chords, the A A flat and G flats and E flats over a C seven, and then D flat being the minor third of a B flat. But the the second statement of that same melody is got these notes as like a major seventh here, and this is the sharp eleven on a major chord. So it's they're relating. Something like that, trying to sing that relative to a key, using even using numbers and saying, oh, this is one and this is flat seven and this is flat six, that is so irrelevant to what's actually going on in the song. The song's not in the key of C. It's not really in the key of F. Maybe only the last two notes feels like the last two notes feels like five, one, and F, but nothing else feels like that at all. So it's really hard to get that frame of reference to be able to use either numbers or solfege as the music gets more complex. So then the question is, is it worth using a technique that we're going to have to abandon later? And that to me is an open question. If we can't really rely on using numbers and solfege as the music gets more complex, is it worth investing a lot in those methods? I, I think the answer is yes, but yes, but it's a hedged yes. And it definitely makes me a little suspicious of the solfege aspect of it. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole fixed dough versus movable dough. In, in, in most English-speaking countries, we use uh, what's called movable dough. So dough is scale degree one, whatever key you're in. And in a lot of other countries, do is just their name for the, the note C. And so that they call that fixed do solfege. To me, that's not even solfege. That's just another name for C. Solfege, to me, is putting a name on a scale degree. Um, so I would think that even in countries that use do to always mean the note C, they would still benefit from uh, being able to put names to syllables. But maybe not. Maybe that just tells us that just using the syllables is actually better. So I, I have my personal reservations about solfege, and yet there is so much great pedagogy around solfege 
such a great history around it and different methods of, of teaching it. Kodai method and all these different methods of teaching. Kodai has these really cool hand signals that can be used. Like I'm just raising my hand up higher and lower to indicate when I'm, like when I went, boo, da, da, and then ba, da, uh, um, I think that's, yeah, that looks like that's on. I probably moved my hand off the, off the, the camera a little bit, but you got the idea. I, I, I'm just sort of doing this uh, visually, moving my hand up and down. Oh, and I talk visually. So are those signals all that useful if you're communicating with a blind musician? Well, no, not necessarily. The blind musician themselves could use them and find value in them, um, but maybe counting on your fingers. One, four, three is more useful. Or maybe it's just playing air piano. Now, I, at one time, I printed out these paper keyboards that was just a picture of a keyboard, and then and then I would I laminated some of them, and then I would bring them in, and then I would play my laminated keyboard. Oh, do I have my melodica handy? Oh, I do have my melodica handy. Um, yay. So, better than air keyboard. It's a real keyboard, but I don't blow into it, and I can go bum, ba, dum, ba, da, da, dum, and I can be playing the notes um, here and really making a really clear, specific association between what I think I'm singing and what I'm, you know, what I know I'm singing, but what notes I think I'm singing and what they are. And then I can test it by actually blowing into things. Boo, ba, dum, boo, bum, bum, and then I can blow. Yeah, and then ba dum did I get? Oh, I might have missed. I might have played the A, but I, I meant to play G F sharp. Is that really an F sharp? Yeah, ba dum. So I can kind of test myself as I go along by just blowing into the thing every once in a while. So melodica, to me, fantastic ear training tool if you use it that way. But you can get a lot of value just out of a paper keyboard and then doing your own kind of self checks. So um. I've been talking about melody. I haven't even really talked that much about harmony, but the idea that we can learn to hear chord progressions. Um, so yeah, in uh, in I see. So yeah, um, so th there is no there is no advantage. I would say to whether you call this note here C or whether you call it Do doesn't matter. Um, one might argue one advantage of putting letter names to them is then they go in order, but then you still have to deal with that whole stupid, like, oh, after G comes A. Oh, unless you're in Germany. Oh, because after A comes B, unless you're in Germany, and then it's H, because what, they thought we weren't going to notice? Or I I, I, I mean, it, it, it's sort of crazy, and Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, T, or C, Do is, it, it's just arbitrary. So to me, that six of one half dozen the other, what you call the things. But to me, there is value in being able to deal with things at a scale degree level. So if that original melody, boo da dum. If I was working away from my instrument, I didn't know that first note was C, but I knew it was one four three five sharp four six five. That's a useful bit of information to know because now if I want to take that same melody into the key of E flat. C, D, E flat. Now I have to reset my brain to think about E flat. Ba da 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 dum. Boo, ba dum, ba da da dum. I was able to sing that same melody in E flat based on this knowledge. Well, I could have sung it without that, but, but I can also work out exactly what those notes were. One, four, A flat, three, G, five, B flat, sharp, four, A, six, C, 5 B flat. Um, so that having that ability to put numbers to it is valuable in helping you be independent of key. Whether you use numbers or whether you use solfege for that, then that doesn't matter. Um, but there is definitely value in having a separate idea of names of notes versus names or numbers to talk about scale degrees. So uh, that's my response there. Um, yeah, I, I like my melodica. It's fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, as far as hearing chords go, um, it's funny because I hear chord progressions, but I hear them in a totally different way. Um, 
the way that I hear chord progressions is more of a big picture thing. It's not necessarily hearing individual notes. So for instance, I'm going to play this arrangement of Oh Susanna. Don't look at the screen. Um, you know, if you're looking, don't look or I'll, I'll minimize the thing. Okay, uh, I stopped short of getting to the uh, refrain. So I can tell you that when I listen to that, I can very clearly hear the fact that there's a one chord and a five chord in that, and when it goes back and forth between them. But how am I really hearing that? Because there's a lot of notes happening there. There's, so now I'll switch over to it. Um, doo -da -bum, so the melody, I have to almost ignore the melody and try to focus on the left hand. I hear I hear this and then I hear that and then I hear and somehow my ear has to add all that up and say, "You know what? I've really only heard a one chord. I've only heard a G chord so far." So far. And now I'm aware that I'm hearing a 5 chord. How? That is harder to put into words because I can't use all the same tricks that I just talked about in hearing melody. And yet, I will claim that you can totally learn to hear when each of these chords happen, the, the distinct characters of these chords, but not in isolation. Like, I don't, I'm not going to tell you that I can tell you what the note A sounds like. That's perfect pitch. I don't have that ability. I can just tell you how to find A, given that I'm in the key of C, and I can sing my way through a tonic triad. Um, I already forgot where C is. See, that I told you. That. Oh, no, actually, can I still find C? See, am I even right? I'm, I'm just guessing, to be honest. See, yep, okay, good. I had to think about this. People with perfect pitch would have just done that, right? I had, I had to kind of go based on try to reclaim my memory of when I was in the key of C before, because I've heard too much G now. Um, and then I sang an E flat for a little while. Um, okay, so I've got my, my C back. Um, so if I wanted to know where A is, I go C, E, G, a and there's my A or C B A and get walked down to the A. Either way I can get to the A but I don't necessarily know what an A sounds like. Similarly I can't even tell you what an A minor chord sounds like. I can't even tell you what the sixth chord sounds like all by itself. Um, there's like a joke about the guy who supposedly could play uh, 64th notes. He was so good he could play 64th notes on his trumpet and then the other trumpet player said yeah yeah let me hear one. And the joke being that, well, a 64th note is only impressive if you play, like, you know, six, a whole bunch of them in a row. Blah, 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 blah. Um, it's not impressive just to go bump because then it's just one short note. So similarly, being able to tell where one A minor chord is or one six chord, minor six chord, is not, I, I can't do it. Um, I can't tell you what that chord sounds like, but I can tell you what it sounds like when six goes to two because this is the circle of fifths and I, you can learn what that sounds like and these are some of the skills that I can I think we can convey by looking at music in little chunks of things and saying well this I can't tell you what a five chord sounds like all by itself um, because all dominant seventh chords sound alike I mean that D7 at this moment we don't know if that is the five chord in the key of G, or if it's the flat seven chord in the key of E, or the the uh, the dominant seventh six chord in uh, you know in the key of F. There's a lot of things that that chord could have been. Um, we only know it's the five by its relationship to one. Oh, here was one. There was there was five. There's one. There's five. One five one. And I'm singing like different melody notes within that chord. So. You can learn what one and five sound like relative to each other, and then once you're kind of good with that, uh, I'll start here. There's one, one, five, one, five. Here comes four. Right? When we get to the four chord in that song, it's like, oh, what is this new thing that just happened? To me, this song is beautiful for demonstrating that. We hear this yin and yang of back and forth of one and five for that whole verse, and then when the four chord comes, it's like, oh, we've, we've arrived somewhere new. 
um, it's not a key change. It's just a sort of temporary arrival point. And to me, that's how you learn what one, four, and five are, by, by hearing how they work in the context of a song. And then when we get to more complicated chord progressions, like this other harmonization that I created, I would claim we can similarly learn what this, one, four, so one, four, three, six, I'm singing the roots there. We can learn what that um, sounds like, right? Uh, and again, I can't tell you what those chords sound like individually because that doesn't really have enough context for them. But when you hear a one, four, three, six often enough and are aware that's what you're hearing, and maybe you're hearing it because you're picking out those roots, but realistically, even if the roots weren't played, I would be able to hear that. But I will tell you that I, I know the exact moment that the light, I know my light bulb moment for that came listening to a bass player named Paul Warburton, a great bass player who lives here in Denver, who um, uh, sort of indirectly had taught me a lot about what I know about chords just from working with him and listening to him. Um, and being chewed out by him when I did something he didn't like, um, but uh, or at least being glared at. Um, so uh, anyhow, uh, there was one one performance I went to, and he was playing bass, and there was a certain song that they were playing that I knew one way, and I kept hearing him go boom, one boom 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 and i kept hearing him do that line and then he did it on some other song boom 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 and again not one that i knew normally would go one four three six and he did it a whole bunch of times and then including one place where i knew uh, knew that song is going one four three six and then eventually i realized he was using one four three six as like a a unit of of harmony and using it in places where I wouldn't have known that, like the origin, like the lead sheet that I learned it from didn't go that way. And he was played it that way. And that's where I learned to see that one, four, three, six as a unit that can be inserted anytime you're trying to get from one to two. Um, you're trying to get from a one chord to a two chord. In this case, it's a dominant 7-2, but even if it had been a minor 2, it would have been the same story. So I learned to hear that little unit of harmony um, that way. And there's any number of them. And there's genre-specific ones. Like, so this was a jazz setting. This is kind of a jazzy arrangement of Oh, oh Susanna. But there's similar, uh, you know, just particular sequences of chords that are really common in some of them common in pretty much any genre of music some of them are maybe specifically in jazz some of them might specifically in irish folk music or in classical music or baroque music versus uh versus uh, romantic era music um so we can learn to hear these like combinations of chords how this chord sounds like while it relates to this chord I can't tell you how to, is exactly what it sounds like any more than I can tell you what blue looks like. I can just show you a bunch of things that are blue and say that thing they have in common, that's that's what blue is, and then you, and, and then you get that. So then the same is going to be true learning these things orally. And I, when I'm talking about learning what blue is, it re reminds me that one of my purposes here is, is uh, trying to make certain concepts clear to a blind musician. So that maybe doesn't mean anything talking about blue, but certainly you can learn round that way, right? Well, what does round really mean? Well, you, you put your hand on something that's a ball, you put your hand on something that's some, you know, a, a, a saucer or a, a cup or in the, and, you know, uh, other, a vase, all these things that all somehow capture the idea of being round and somehow your brain puts it together. Oh, I guess that's what round means. It's the thing that these have in common. So I can't tell you what 1436 sounds like. I can play you a bunch of 1436s in a bunch of different songs and a bunch of different voicings and a bunch of different contexts. And then at some level it starts to click. Oh, that's what 1436 sounds like, even though it's different context for that 1436. So these are all the sorts of things that I want to be talking about, can be talking about, etc. So I want to um, kind of wrap up here because I'm just sort of excited and talking about a lot of different things. Um, uh, and I don't want to just go on forever with this. I, I want to start building a plan and doing this. But I, So I'm going to 
well, I'll, no, I'll stay here. What I want to do is, though, get to um, the chat again here. And I, I could do it from here. Um, I'm just going to go to my chat and just type in the address on my website. Give me a minute. Where if you want to be, so if you're not already like on, if you're if you're subscribed to me here on YouTube, great. If not, hit that subscribe button. To be honest, though, I am not sure how good that is at reaching people. I only post to YouTube, like like actually write up a post on YouTube very rarely. Maybe I'll try to do it more. But I don't know that. It, I think it's sort of like with a Facebook page. It doesn't necessarily go out to everyone. So if you want to make sure that you know when I actually launch uh, any sort of podcast or anything that comes of this, I want to make sure that you guys get that information. So I'm going to put in the comments here. I'll put it in the chat now. I'll put it in the comments uh, uh, after. Um, where you can actually sign up and be on the mailing list if you're not already. Meanwhile, though, while I'm getting that up, please, please ask me some questions or give me any more feedback on things that um, you uh, are curious about that you want to see me cover or you know anything that seems relevant to any of this. One thing I haven't talked about is rhythm. I, there's different syllables that people use to uh, sort of vocalize rhythms. Kodai has one set of syllables. I'm more familiar with a, a set of syllables that are called takadimi. It comes from uh, Indian classical music. And the difference there is the Kodai syllables are based on the length of the note, like ta, ti, ti for quarter, eighth, eighth. Whereas takadimi is based on the position within the me measure. Takadimi, takadimi is one and two and three and four and and it's always looked at in in groups of two beats like that because that's how, in the same way that we can kind of chunk chords together, we can chunk rhythms together and see two beats at a time. So anyhow, the takadimi um, system is another way of uh, kind of uh, verbalizing things about rhythms that is uh, also useful. So. Um, I'm uh, getting sidetracked, but no. I, I but my point is, I would really love it if uh, people would um, uh, ask me some more questions or just give me some more feedback about any of this. And um, uh, yeah, just give me feedback about this and give me something to reply to while I'm sitting here stalling and trying to get this link together. Um, I think I have that link now. So go over here in my chat. Oh, wrong window. Dang it. Dang it, dang it, dang it. Um, oh, I can do this. Um, so it's it's back over here, back right here. Uh, mm -mm 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 -mm. All right. So. Um, newsletter link so here's the link where if you haven't been getting any emails from me like if you didn't just get like some email from me on Monday um, uh, yeah if you didn't get email from me Monday talking about this you're not on the list so you you might want to click this if so if you're just new about this from other sources like the fact that you've watched the cafes before um, uh, um, then you, you, I, I would love it if you would put on this so I can make sure I can reach you. So I see a comment here. Uh, okay, I'm going to work my way backwards. Um, so uh, thanks, Kyle. Uh, oh, by the way, Kyle, I've also looked at some things about um, uh, there, there is an option I can turn on that allegedly is going to put automatic um, uh, captions on the videos while I'm doing them live. I have no confidence in how well that works, but I do know that the YouTube automatic captioning s system is relatively okay compared to some other standalone ones I've tried. Um, but uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm curious uh, if that'll end up working uh, and how you'll what you'll think about that. Um, so Rick, 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 is it Beto? I don't know. I see this name all the time. Um, so I haven't done a stream. I'm going to come back to uh, Rick Beto in a second. Uh, I have not done a stream about the synthesizer and sound fonts because it's not like my own personal area of specialty. I just normally go with the defaults. But 
everything is changing so radically from MuseScore 4 that uh, when that stuff starts to come together, I will definitely be talking about it. But sure, I do these cafes every week. No reason I can't just talk about something about them now. But I would love it if some other people who do know more about it can maybe join in. And so maybe I will uh, actually... Um, you know, do an interview with someone who can talk more about it. Speaking of interviews, that's something else I want to do uh, in this podcast thing. That's something that's done often in podcasts, is maybe do an interview with someone else who has a different perspective on your training or theory. Or actually do like a lesson, like actually work with a student who's like, and, and coach the student in real time on transcribing the melody or whatever it is that we're doing um, and kind of work them through, lead them to the answer and you all kind of listen along. So is it pronounced Beato? So I've never actually watched one of his videos. Beato. Okay. Okay. So there you go. Now, uh, I, I, I never know. Um, so I have a student in, uh, in my uh, theory class that I just uh, uh, am teaching at a university uh, that I just met yesterday and uh, his name J-A-N-I-E-L and it looks like Daniel and but it starts with a J and his last name with Therese and so I'm like okay it's Yaniel but no he's like no it's Daniel um so anyhow I when I try to pronounce things the way I think is going to be the uh the the clever more language uh centric way of pronouncing it I sometimes am wrong okay so um yeah so Rick definitely has some things figured out right uh because I know his name even if I don't know how to pronounce it and I see references and links to his stuff so it's definitely someone I need to be checking out more and so he's definitely done uh more uh um uh yeah I think I actually did watch one of the what makes this song great videos like long ago um okay so uh the um Oh, good. Yeah, Susie, great. Great to have you join us and glad you uh, joined us in the chat. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, the, yeah, and I have, you know, we all have, there's lots of sources for information on uh, theory and ear training and stuff, whether it's books or courses, and uh, I've got my stuff in that space. But the idea of doing this as a purely oral thing is uh, where it's literally just a podcast or something is, is really kind of a... Uh, um, interesting to me right now. So um, it felt like there was something else I was going to respond to. Oh yeah, here it is. Working from recognizable examples. Um, okay, so he here's another thing about podcasts and y'all are gonna like, maybe you're gonna laugh at me, you're gonna groan, um, but I'm gonna check it out anyhow. So one of the things is uh, on YouTube, you can use copyrighted music. Um, you could, I, could, I could take a pop song, I could take a jazz uh, standard, um, and use it as an example in YouTube because YouTube has these amazingly clever algorithms for for checking out the recordings and and uh, um, identifying based on like a fingerprint within the sound you know what material you're using and they will automatically set everything up so there's an ad inserted into your video and the the revenue from that ad uh, goes to the actual copyright holder it's it's an amazingly um, clever scheme that YouTube has and it works quite well um, but uh, it only works on YouTube. You, there's nothing like that then for podcasts. So I wouldn't, and so, so basically I could use copyrighted materials in YouTube. I would not be able to in a podcast, not without actually negotiating a license with each and every uh, copyright owner. I could choose to only use public domain material. I could choose to, you know, and classical music. Anytime I pick a classical piece, that'll be okay. But I have a clever idea. Um, and it, it, it's clever, but it's grown worthy also. So one of the things that people do with podcasts, I mean, podcasts are generally free. Um, some people are in the podcast business and they make their money by like doing like sponsorships and stuff. And they do a little commercial at the beginning of the podcast, you know, drink, you know, drink Coca-Cola. I drink it all the time and uh, Coke gives me money to say that. I mean, I, I, I don't see myself doing that. Right. Um, but that's what, that is definitely a thing. But, advertisers are all set up for that sort of thing. So what if I used commercial jingles as recognizable songs um, to demonstrate particular um, theoretical concepts and to work through as examples? They could be recognizable commercial jingles. Now the th thing is, culturally speaking, yeah, there's a recognizable jingle in America that won't be recognizable in Argentina. I get that, I get that. Um, but the point is that I will be able to use a kind of an interesting variety of music, and there is no way Subway 
is going to call me up and say, you know what, we're going to sue you because you used our jingle in your podcast. No. If anything, they're going to say, hey, wow, free advertising. Can we give you money? And I'll say, no, I'm not really, you know, I'm not, I'm not promoting Subway. I'm just using your jingle. Why I pick on the Subway jingle? Oh, because it is one of the world's most awesome demonstrations of the minor four chord. And anyone who's watched any of my other theory things where I go off on the minor four chord, um, it's amazingly beautiful chord. Um, amazingly beautiful chord that I will play you right here in a second. Um, uh, Oh, I thought I had a minor four chord in here. Um, 